We are uh, in Acts again today, and uh, I had wanted to get through all the way through uh, chapter 19. <coughs> um, I think we'll start chapter 20 next week, <coughs> but uh, we, did not, we will not be getting through all of chapter 19. Um, and uh, so let's just uh, open in, in a word of prayer. Lord God in heaven, we thank you for your goodness and your grace towards us in Jesus Christ. We thank you that you are all powerful. And God, I pray that uh, we would um, we would be continuing to open to be open to learning that, and not thinking, "Oh yeah, I got that, I understand." Um, but God, that we would be open to growing in our understanding of what that means that you are all powerful, and what that means that you are in control, and that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to you. And God, that we would walk in the conscious remembrance of that truth more and more. God, I pray that you'd be in my words this morning and that you would be with the kids downstairs and the teachers downstairs. And God, that your spirit would just be present. And God, we just want to be open to being still, knowing that you are God and Lord God, knowing that you have something for us here this morning. And I pray, Lord God, that we would be open to it. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and living Savior, we pray these things. One more thing, Lord God, protect us from the forces of darkness that are about. Have our minds clear and set on you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, so we're going to continue, and we're going to just jump in to Acts uh, 19. I'm going to jump in at verse 8, and we've uh, talked about this a little bit last week, but we'll, this is where we'll start. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for, the, for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So that, that would be those that are a part of the, the Jews in that uh, synagogue. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannius. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary thing, miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons, um, aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. We see from Acts 19, 10 uh, through to 12 that the gospel is being preached and it is spreading. So no, let's, let's, let's know what's taking place here. In the a spiritual battle that is raging here on earth for the hearts and souls of humanity at this point in history in Asia, God's side in the power of Jesus Christ is prevailing. And God through his people is winning. The light is being pushed back in the darkness. Sorry, the, the darkness is being pushed back and the light is shining. People are being saved and they are maturing in Jesus Christ. And we've talked about this all the way through. This has happened in Acts before. Whether you get this, this idea or you get this picture, if, if, if you're paying attention, of the kingdom of God spreading, right? So there's this kind of like this movement thing happening where people are hearing the word of God and, 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 and the, the, the lost are being saved, the saved are being mature, matured. And we see in this next section to some degree how Paul's boldness is, is actually impacting this area. And it's not just impacting the unsaved, but it's also impacting the spiritual, in the spiritual realm, right? Uh, and it says this, So some Jews went around driving out evil spirits, and tried to invoke the name of Jesus Christ over, over th those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Siva, a Jewish uh, chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the, men who had the, then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them, and, on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. These men began casting out demons using the name of Jesus as they connected Jesus to the one that Paul teaches about or, or preaches. Note that these are Jewish men doing this, meaning these are men who likely had previously heard Paul's teaching about Jesus, right, just in the previous passage that we read, and actually had rejected it, right? And, 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 that's, and so, so what, what Paul does, because they reject it, he leaves the synagogue. So he, th this is those likely men that are connected to that group, 
They rejected Paul. They rejected his preaching, and they clearly, through that, had rejected Jesus Christ. So although they are enemies of Paul to some degree, let's, say, let's call them passive enemies, they could clearly see that the name of Jesus Christ that was being proclaimed through Paul carried profound spiritual power in the spiritual realms. So these men begin casting out demons or trying to cast out demons in the name of Jesus Christ that Paul preaches. Now, it should be noted that in, uh, it is somewhat unclear in the Greek. Some translations make it sound that these guys had been doing this a little while, and then this is the last time, likely, they tried it. Okay, this story is the last time that they tried it. Other translations would seem to suggest that this is the first time that they tried it, and it didn't work out, okay? So there's some ambiguity on that. There's some different perspectives on that. That's not really what's most important, so we, I, I don't want to spend any time trying to like argue through that. What I want us to note is that what is important in this, in this passage is that even the opponents of Paul are recognizing how profoundly powerful is the name of Jesus Christ, right? How profoundly powerful is the name of Jesus Christ? And what we also need to note is that Jesus Christ's name creates fear, creates change, creates action in the spiritual realm, right? That's the truth that we need to focus on. Now, now there is some, 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 some question here. Can people who don't know Jesus still cast out demons in the name of Jesus? Can that happen? Because that's what these guys tried to do. And we recognize that there's other places in Scripture, we're going to look at them in a moment, that it seems like people can do that. Let's look at Matthew 7, to 23. Jesus, this is what Jesus says in Matthew 7, 22. May, may, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did you not prophesy did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name, drive out demons. And in your name, perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, Jesus says, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. In this passage, we see that people who don't truly know Jesus still seem to be able to, at times, cast out demons in Jesus' name. This is a testimony to the power of Jesus' name, though. Like, recognize. Recognize, though, what that shows us that even people that don't necessarily know Jesus and have a personal relationship with him, when they call on the name of Jesus or when they use the name of Jesus, there is still powerful, powerful presence, right? Demons are fearful of the name of Jesus. Though most humans on earth do not recognize who Jesus is, or the power that he carries, we need to recognize and remember and realize, I think, maybe even believe a little bit more intensely, that in the spiritual realm, there is no ignorance as to who Jesus is. There is no misunderstanding. In the spiritual realm, even the demons know who God is. The demons understand Jesus Christ. Power. Uh, in in, in um, Luke 10, 17, another passage, we see this. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he replied, I saw, seven, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However... Do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Even before Jesus died and was raised to life, he held great power over the forces of darkness. Why? Because he was and is the Son of God and one with God. After his death and resurrection, Jesus in Matthew 20, uh, 28, 18 tells his disciples even more that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus is and holds the ultimate authority over all creation, including Lucifer and the darkness and demons. I'm going to say that again. Jesus is and holds the ultimate authority over all of creation, including Lucifer and his demons. 
This is why we are to live lives calling on the name of Jesus. There is no greater authority in this life. Yes, the one, who, the one yeah, we were supposed to do that, yes, the one time. You know, like when we're kids or, or when we're, we're just coming to know Jesus, we're supposed to call on the name of Jesus, repent for our sins, ask Jesus into our heart. Yes, we're supposed to do that as that kind of that one-time thing where we say, okay, I'm no longer going my way, I'm, I'm following Jesus, right? And we get baptized, and yes, we're supposed to do that, but we're supposed to call on the name of Jesus day by day because today, July 17th, there is no greater spirit. There is no greater authority on this physical earth and in heaven than Jesus Christ. So it only makes sense that day by day, as we're going through hard things, as things come up and as, as life is interacting with us and as we fail or as we succeed, we call in the name of Jesus. He is the ultimate authority of your life. No matter what it looks like in terms of your bank account, no matter what it looks like in terms of a relationship with the people around you, no matter what it looks like in terms of the economy and where the job's going, no matter what it looks like in terms of rain in your fields, right, or your, your truck and your, you know, the tires and I just can't afford, and no matter what's going on in your life, the ultimate authority is Jesus Christ. And, I, and that's why we call on him and I pray that's why you, day by day, talk with him call on him. You, you understand fully. It's not just the demons. It's not just the demons that understand who he is in his power. But we who follow him understand who he is in his power, right? Amen, I pray. So then what happened? Why were these, why were these guys not able to, like how come it, it seems that then in this situation that these guys didn't have the power or, or Jesus' name didn't have power? What, what was going on? What failed for them? I believe there are two reasons that we kind of need to look at first and foremost. Yes, Jesus' name ha held and holds great power over the demonic world. But these men had no understanding who Jesus was and had, in fact, rejected who he was. Now, we see that people that don't know him necessarily can still use his name. But we see here just maybe this hint of, if you have outright rejected who God is, you have no place to use his name. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, connecting with the first though, but it, it connects with the first point, but this is probably more clearly, these men were trying to use the name of Jesus to bolster their own exorcism ministry. They were exorcists. That's what they went around doing. And they wanted to bolster that, that ministry. They wanted to succeed and look good casting out demons. And they realized the name of Jesus that Paul preaches, that there is nothing, that, that is it, man. So we're going to use that. We're going to use this formula, so to speak. But they were trying to use the name of Jesus and his power for their own purposes and glory. And we've actually seen that already in Acts several times. God doesn't, go, do, God doesn't connect well with that when we try that. I believe that the, the demon understands this. And, and even if the demon doesn't quite understand this, we recognize that Jesus Christ understood this. And all authority, even this demon, is under Jesus Christ. So I believe that Jesus Christ allowed what took place next. And why? Because the demon's reaction to these men in terms of just jumping on them and, and beating them up and sending them running, saying, well, I know who Jesus is and I know Paul, right? I know about Paul, but I don't know you. What this does, and I believe Jesus is an ultimate authority, so Jesus allows it, is to clarify to these people and everyone watching exactly where these people actually stood with Jesus. It clarifies to us, the readers, but it also clarified to those that were in that day exactly where these people were with Jesus, these Jewish people that were trying to use this formula for their own purposes. They had previously rejected him, and they did not understand the power that they were calling on. When these men tried to use the powerful name of Jesus Christ, 
uh, it, it did not work. And the demon was allowed to attack them to reveal where they really were at. Um, and, let, but so, and, and recognize that how, how, did this, how did this bring God glory, right? That, that, that maybe is a question that you should stop and say, okay, well, why did God, why did Jesus allow this to happen? Okay, it reveals these people's hearts, but what, is, what does everyone else do? And I think that's where we kind of see, yeah, this, this was to reveal where these people were at, but it also, look, let's pay attention to what this did. As people recognized, whoa, 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 that is a name you don't mess with. That's, that's, that's what people got from this. Let's look at what takes place in verse 17. When this became known to the Jews and the Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done, and a number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burnt them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drach drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread wildly, widely sorry, and grew in power. This caused people to fear the name of the Lord. Also, because of this, many who believed came and openly confessed their sin. These events led to the, the time of purging of sin or a time of conviction and open confection, confession for the church. This didn't just impact you know, the, the non-saved. This impacted actually even more per, like precisely, even more clearly, even more deeply. This impacted the church. And there's this time of open confession. In verse 19, we see believers so wanting to rid themselves of their former ways and their former um, connection with sorcery that they burn their scrolls publicly. They wanted people in the church and outside of the church to know that they gave up totally their old ways. They gave up totally their, pay attention now, their old ways were really their own ways, right? Their old ways were really their own ways. And they wanted so badly that people, they recognized the evil of their old ways. They recognize the evil of their own ways, that they take their books and their scrolls and they burn them. Note that they didn't sell the books. Maybe one of your first thoughts, why did they sell them? They could have made some money, maybe gave that, you know, to the church. Why didn't they sell them? They understood the contents of those scrolls were evil, and although they were of great value, they were not of Christ and were of darkness. These Christians wanted nothing to do with their old ways and their own ways any longer. Now that they were in Christ, th those old ways were rubbish. They were garbage. And even though they had worldly value, they had no value to them any longer. They were evil. They led to evil. And therefore, they needed to be destroyed. They needed to be destroyed. This calls us to consider our own personal lives, does this not? And what in our lives pulls us away from this incredibly powerful God, Jesus Christ? In your daily walk, in relationship with Jesus, what pulls you away? What really should maybe you throw out? And have you been, have you been challenged? Have you been open to hear the word of the Lord speak to you and say, there's some things that need to be thrown out. There are some things that need to be thrown out. Not just put away for a time. Not sold so that you can make some money and you know, give some of that back to the Lord. But this old way is evil and it needs to be destroyed. Are there things in your life that lead you to practice evil? And I don't mean, I don't think any of us here Practice evil, it is nice and cool. The, the further I come this way, because of the fans there. Um, I don't think there's, there's any of us that are like calling on demons. So like, don't think that this talks about, like when I'm talking about the evil that needs to get thrown out, yes, for them it was scrolls. Yes, it was them, it was scrolls. For us, we don't have, I, I doubt any of us have some scrolls at home, although comics, you know, not to, not to, you know, bug anyone, but comics have some, 
could be close to that sorcery scroll kind of stuff. Uh, maybe some movies, right? Maybe some books that we have, maybe some movies that we watch. But think about it. So none of us necessarily engage in sorcery, I'm assuming. If you do, come talk to me. We probably should have some conversation about that. But what in your life could be thrown out? Because it pulls you away from that relationship, that daily relationship. Maybe it takes away your, 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 your conscious awareness of Jesus Christ. Maybe it, it distracts you. But that it pulls you away from you seeking that powerful, all authority, all loving, all good Jesus Christ daily. Maybe it leads you to not, you know, calling demons, but maybe it leads you to practice evil like selfishness or anger or self-indulgence or sexual impurity. Are there things that carry, that carry within them, how about this, teachings and lessons that reveal evil, evil things or lead us to want things that are connected to sin and self? Are there things that, and this is really the, 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 the real question, are there things that would honor the Lord if you threw them out? As we consider everything this morning, we are led to three conclusions for our hearts to apply. First, let us fully rest in this incredible truth, and it is an incredible truth. The Jesus that we serve is the one and only true God. And he is truly greater. He holds ultimate power and authority in this creation. So let him hold ultimate power and authority in your situation. He holds absolute power and authority in this creation. So let him hold absolute power and authority in your situation. Even the demons fear and are, are subject to his name and power. Let us believe and remember this week, Jesus is greater. And guys, not just Jesus is greater, but like our Jesus is greater. I pray that you're like my Jesus, the Jesus that loves me, that forgave me. He's greater. That, that should draw us to running to him moment by moment, day by day. Our God is greater. We trust and follow Jesus Christ, the one who is greater. Colossians 2, 9 says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. Number two, let us also search our lives and hearts to see if we have any unconfessed sin. And if there is, let us take time to confess our sins and turn from them. Ask, the, ask our good and gracious Jesus, God uh, in Jesus Christ to forgive us. Remembering and celebrating that when we ask for forgiveness, he forgives. 1 John 1, 1.9 says, If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And lastly, if we have things in our lives that we need to throw out, let us not ignore them or pretend that they are okay and they're not really that bad. Let us, th let us throw them out. Burn them publicly if we must, recognizing that in Christ, our former ways have no longer any true value in comparison to what we gain in Christ. Philippians 3, 7 to 9 says, but whatever, were, what, but whatever was gained to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. This week and beyond, let us rid ourselves of all that pulls us away from Christ Jesus our Lord. For our good God is greater. Let's pray. Lord God, you are greater, and I pray that we would recognize that. And recognizing, Lord God, that, um, that your people, like Paul does, Lord, when he's focused on you, and you are using him, and he is open to be used by you. Lord, and he's engaged in teaching and discipleship. God, that you want to do great things. 
that the whole province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God, and we know that that wasn't just Paul doing that. That you used Paul, and then as you used Paul, that impacted others, and others would share, and others, God, it grew. God, I pray that we live in such a way, and we follow you in such a way, and we throw out anything, Lord God, that would hold us back from you. And Lord God, that you would be able to use us in a powerful way. Lord God, that all the province of Saskatchewan, Lord God, would be hearing about the word of the Lord. God, that's what you want. For we know, Lord, your heart is about saving the lost and maturing the saved. And God, that you call us into your purposes towards that. God, I just pray that this morning that as we come into communion and as we just take a moment to kind of search your heart here in a minute, God, that you bring to mind by the leading of your Holy Spirit anything that we need to, to talk to you about. That we would be open, Lord God, that if you call us to repent, that we would repent. That if you call us, Lord God, to throw it out, no matter what it is, Lord God, that we would be willing to throw it out. Lord, if there is anything in our lives holding us from knowing you better and being closer to walking with you, I pray, Lord God, that you would reveal it to us. And then, Lord God, that you would buy... Um, from the hope that we have in you, Lord God, that, that we would want to, to throw everything out and only hold on to you. God, grow our, grow our understanding of how much of a treasure you are. And then, Lord God, that we personally would, would make you our treasure more and more and more. We thank you, Lord God, for your goodness and grace. We thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen.